So I'm Kate Vancourt French. Um, I was a principal at Vancourt Instruments. We started our business in Holyoke and then moved in the industrial park in Northampton. And in the early 90s, we had about 125 employees. Uh, we had an opening for a receptionist to which Sherry applied for. She was being interviewed in the HR office when I was walking down the hall. She sat poised this beautiful young woman in a yellow, crisp suit. I retraced my steps to take another look. She had such poise, confidence, and friendliness. Just in those few seconds, you could see it. I think of that moment more than any other moment when I think of Sherry. Working in our industrial park location gave Sherry the benefit of having lunch with her 17-month-old Cedric at the daycare center right around the corner was then I was introduced to her mother, Yoko, when she picked up Sherry together to go over to have lunch. I didn't know she had a sister. I didn't know she was being abused. It had been a normal winter day in January, on January 12, 1993. We closed up around five and Sherry left a few minutes later. I don't recall if she knew the buzz that she was up for a promotion. The relative peaceful existence at Van Court came to an abrupt end early the next morning when an employee called me at home and had learned on the police scanner that Sherry and Cedric had been murdered. As employees came to work, some had sunken red eyes and others arrived wondering, why all the tears? In a matter of hours, the entire workforce was coping with the news. And so it began that I attempted to block the leaks in our ship. I had no clue. The reporters started calling. It never occurred to me that the media would be a factor. The Springfield paper fighted with, was fighting with the Northampton paper for a lead story. I had no problem setting that one straight. Our shipper's birthday was coming up on the weekend. He had phoned Sherry that night and couldn't get through. He was racked with pain. What if he had called earlier? Would it have made a difference? The detectives came to the plant. They were gathering information such as phone logs, phone bills, and they interviewed some of the women with whom Sherry was friendly. And this was helpful to some of the employees. They felt a connection to the situation. It made them feel needed. The detectives came, um, kept in contact over the next few months, including providing us with updates. They knew Van Court had suffered a loss too. Meanwhile, the phones kept ringing. We put customers off for a while, then the employees began picking up their jobs again. There's comfort in doing repetitive work. Some people didn't want to talk about it. Some people craved talking about it. I spent days looking into those leaks, into the hull, and trying to fix them. I wasn't prepared for how long the grief would last. The wake and funeral came. A great number of employees attended one or both. It was there I became more acquainted with Yoko and Sherry, sister, Jeannie. A few days after the services, Yoko called to ask if there was any insurance to help offset the funeral. We had none. She wanted to know about Sherry's last paychecks. We had thought about that, and DES instructed us how to proceed. I invited Yoko to come to our office. I think she wanted to be everywhere that Sherry had ever been. We spoke for a long time, and there was little I could do to help her. Talking was helpful to me, and I'm pretty sure it was helpful to her. It was then I learned from Yoko some of the grisly details of the murders and that Yoko and Jeannie couldn't go into Sherry's apartment. No one was stopping them. They just couldn't go in there. It was too terrible, too horrifying. How would they tend to Sherry's things? And I said, don't worry, I'll do it. And so began three days of cleaning Sherry and Cedric's apartment 
with two hand-picked volunteer employees. We agreed that this was between Sherry and us, and we never spoke of it again after we completed the job. It took our breath away when we saw the dangling phone. We prepared the furniture for a woman's shelter. We cleaned the bathroom where one of the police officers had been sick. We just did it. What Sherry and Cedric went through was unbearable and unthinkable. Mary spoke about domestically abused vic victims were courageous. Well, I want you to know that Sherry was very courageous and determined, and she courageously fought off her attacker. Meanwhile, our employees were not getting over the pain. The reception desk where Sherry sat separated the plant from the office. People hated walking by it. Some cried at just seeing her desk. We hired a temp, and then another temp, and then another. Collectively, the employees would not allow these people into our net. I searched among the 125 employees and found someone amongst us who was ready for the job. That relieved the situation, and she became our receptionist. And it was more than I could handle, and I needed help. There was nothing in the yellow pages, and it was before the internet. No one came forward to suggest where I could get help. There weren't any programs. I found a reputable therapist at Smith College, and she made some calls on our behalf. And she found a therapist in Darien, Connecticut, whose specialty was grief counseling in the workplace. He predicted that over a relatively short period of time, there would be a mass exodus. <laughs> I said, no, no way, not Van Court. He made multiple visits. The group meetings were optional, and many attended. By the third visit, the numbers began to lessen, but the things he told me would happen did. Turnover was beginning. One woman in her 60s flashed back to her childhood when she had been abused. She didn't leave, although many wished that she had. She was so mean for a while there. There was a young woman who cried every day, admitted to have been abused, sobbed to tell me she had to go. Another woman was pissed off at Sherry. How could she have left, let herself be in that situation and put that boy in that position? She had no patience for anyone. The shipper was still a wreck, but he was starting to come out of it. I never would believed I would have lost a single employee. I lost several quickly and more within the six months, and then the leaks began to stop. I felt so badly for Sherry's sister, Jeannie, who lived in Rochester, New York at the time. She was so far away from here, from home, from Yoko, and she was having a difficult time. I started sending her a card every week or so. Yoko, she visited Sherry's grave every day, blizzards included. Months later, there was a trial. Some of our records were subpoenaed, as were a few people. We sat with the family during recess and with other witnesses. The bonding to Sherry continued. My records were stipulated so I could sit among the supporters with Jeannie and Yoko in the courtroom. It was difficult to believe that we were at the trial of the woman in the yellow suit with a beautiful smile. Toward the end of the trial, Yoko phoned me at work with the day's trial results. It had been an awful day. The Q's family took up most of the seats, and Jeannie and Yoko were alone. She hoped we'd come to closing arguments tomorrow. We went to the employees at Van Court and relayed Yoko's phone call. We said, if you want to go, wear your Van Court t-shirt and be in the parking lot at 8 o'clock sharp. We'd have to be early. Before 8 o'clock that next morning, the parking lot was filled with Van Court people in t-shirts, filling up the backs of trucks and overpacking cars. We filled in the rest of Sherry's side of the courtroom and nearly half of the opposing side. We felt victorious and united. 
It was an incredible release for the employees, and including me. District Attorney Scheibel won a conviction that would never allow the accused out of prison. Even his attempt at a second trial in Berkshire County kept him in his place. It's not socially correct to tell you what I wish the verdict had been. It's not allowed in Massachusetts. Since those days, Yoko has become a respected and tireless advocate against domestic violence. How could she not? Look how she was robbed. Jeannie moved back from Rochester to be closer to her mother and has two children now. Many years ago, while visiting relatives in Yoko's native Japan, Jeannie and Sherry wrote Millennium Letters. Sherry's was addressed to Yoko, filled with her hopes and dreams never to be fulfilled. You know, Sherry would have been quite embarrassed by all this attention. From the deepest tragedy, a little light can shine. As a company, we became more aware of domestic violence. One of the things I consciously put into place was a level of trust with the employees that they knew wouldn't be violated. Once I made it through their tests, <laughs> they could confide in me, keeping the, se the source a secret. I learned of, wom of a woman who worked for me who was raised in a different culture and was being routinely beaten by her husband and thrown downstairs. Her mother lived with them and sided siding with her cultural upbringing, sided with a husband who could do no wrong. My new contacts at Betsy Scheibel's office led me to numbers, phone numbers of an agency that was run by people just like this employee. They understood her culture. Armed with the numbers and without her knowledge, I met her in a private area. I told her first that I knew what was going on and said, this is America and you have rights. You don't have to take this. You don't have to take the punishment of your husband anymore. We spoke for a long time. I gave her the numbers and we hugged for a long time and there were tears. She didn't call right away, but she did call. She divorced him and she married a man who was devoted to her and her child. Maybe this woman would have had a different outcome if she hadn't been provided the information Maybe if I had known that Sherry had been abused, I could have helped her. We never really know. But I think of the woman in the crisp yellow suit and the beautiful smile. I was in shock at the time of my daughter's Sherry and grandson's murder. And I was not able to do anything but grieving and not able to go to our apartment where crime has occurred. But Kate has volunteered to move in things out of without my knowledge and I am <coughs> forever grateful and appreciate to Kate as long as I live. Kate also brought the people from the company to sit in the court <coughs> in the courtroom during the trial. It helped me a great deal since I have no family member in America besides my only surviving daughter, Jeannie. See many people sitting in a courtroom wearing Van Court Instrument t-shirts and supporting Sherry and Cedric and gave me a strength to sitting through the rest of the trial. Thank you so much for all you have done for me and you are the best employer any victim could have and Sherry loved working for you, and you made her an independent, very happy young mother. Even so, she had a short life. Thank you.